there's got to be other markets, uh, other factors in the market. Like obviously, there's got to be good GDP growth. Uh, I want to see a minimum of three major employers in any one market. Um, and the po- I, I will not invest in a market less than 350,000 people. Welcome to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals who work with investors, buyers, and sellers of commercial real estate coast to coast. Whether you're an investor, broker, lender, property manager, attorney, or accountant, we are here to learn from the experts. Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. This is episode number 77. Weekly, we talk with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide insight and knowledge to help investors grow their real estate portfolio. Whether you're a veteran investor or you've been thinking about investing, we're here to help you and we're glad you're here. My name is Jay Darren Gross. Thanks for joining us today. In just a minute, we're going to speak with Reed Goosens of RSN Property Group. Reed is from Australia, from down under. He's a, an engineer, he's an investor, a syndicator, and he's also the host of the podcast Investing in the U.S., an Aussie's Guide to U.S. Real Estate. We talk about the how and the why to invest in markets that are not in your backyard and more. But first, if you're listening to us on iTunes, make sure to subscribe and leave a five-star review. When you do subscribe, you can listen to the show whenever and wherever you choose. Also, are you on Facebook? Are you on Twitter? Are you on LinkedIn? If so, look me up. J, that's the letter J, Darren, D-A-R-R-I-N, Gross, G-R-O-S-S. And uh, if you're on LinkedIn, be sure to Uh, Check out our group and and, uh, request to join the group, Commercial Real Estate Pro Network Group. Uh, It's a great place to uh, network with commercial real estate professionals. So reach out and let's connect. And uh, let me know you listen to the podcast too, as always. Uh, Like to know that. Also, I want to remind you too, if you are in the middle of a deal and you'd like to talk about it or if you have an insurance question, go ahead and get in touch with me and I'll do all I can to help you. All right, let's get on with the show. On the call this morning, we're fortunate to have my guest. He's from Australia. He's a real estate investor. He's a multifamily uh, real estate investor. He's also a podcaster. My guest today is Reed Goosen. Reed, welcome to the program. G'day, Darren. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I I'm, I'm, couldn't be more delighted to be speaking with you today. Reed uh, is also the the proprietor, the starter, the founder of RSM Property Group, and he has his own uh, podcast, Investing in the U.S., an Aussie's Guide to U.S. Real Estate. And uh, we're excited to talk to you today. Reed, uh, for the listeners, if you could do me a favor and uh, give us a little bit about your background and how you got into real estate. Sure thing. Um, first and foremost, thanks for having me on the show. I uh, it's great to be be doing this. I know we connected a few weeks back or a few months back around Thanksgiving. So um, it's really really good stuff. Um, my background is in structural engineering. I have spent the better part of a decade um, being a structural engineer, working across the globe from London to Australia to New York to Los Angeles. Um, and that I graduated in 07, went backpacking around the world for for, for a few years, uh, came back to Australia and um, picked up that little that little purple book called Rich Dad Poor Dad, and that really really ignited the, the fire in my belly to do more with my life. I was really um, sort of you know sitting in a cubicle, you know I'm sure the the, the the typical story Darren of people who sit in a cubicle get sick and tired of it. They just think there's got to be more to life than just working for a boss and being being feeling like you're a small cog in a huge, huge machine. So that was in 2009. I picked up that book. Uh, in 2011, my fiance uh, is American. And so we actually uh, packed up our bags and moved across the world to New York City. And um, and within two weeks of being in New York City, I, uh, I, had, I was at my first real estate networking event. And, and by gosh, I thought real estate networking in, in Aussie was... Um, was incredible, but in New York City, it was on steroids. And I, you know, I went out there and, and you know, had to teach myself about U.S. real estate because it was, it's a lot different compared to Australia. Uh, and, and since then, since 2011, I've been I've invested in um, quite a significant amount of real estate here in the United States. Started my own podcast to educate other international investors about the benefits of cash flow real estate, and started my own um, uh, RSM Property Group. So that, in a nutshell, is is me. And we can probably dive into more specifics uh, as as the show goes on. 
Oh, that's great. I appreciate that. I'm curious, what, what was the, can you point to one of the significant differences between the Aussie real estate groups and the uh, New York City uh, real estate yeah, um, yeah, well, you know, it's New York City, right? Right, <laughs> it's, right. It's, it's the Big Apple, yeah. I, guess, I think it's sort of that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I guess when I say on steroids, I mean like, you know, so, uh, a group in Australia, in Brisbane, where I was from, maybe had 50 or 60 people at these at, at a networking event. Um, in New York City, there was like 200. <laughs> you know, oh, it was just, wow. it was just, it was just that much more, um, more people. There was, you know, it's a larger city, and you know, the level of, um, you had to bring your game up to that level of you know, everyone in New York City it's you know it's dog eat dog world so it's just a little bit of a different vibe compared to, to compared to home <laughs> yeah no I I love uh, New York City but it is the uh, city that doesn't sleep and exactly and uh, there's uh, always a lot of competition there. that's that's uh, that's great um, well let's talk a little bit about the your the, the type of real estate you're you're in you're in multifamily is that correct that is correct yep all yep. right and what what is it that drew you to real estate, I mean, not to real estate, you mentioned uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad as kind of being a, an impetus, but what was it that, I mean, when you talk about real estate, there's a, a whole gamut of possibilities. What was it that drew you uh, to multifamily? Yeah, that's uh, it's a good question. So when I did first come to uh, the, the US, I still was working full time as a structural engineer. And um, within about six months of being here in the United States, I'd purchased my first duplex in upstate New York. Um, and, and just for all your listeners out there, the biggest difference between Australia and the United States is that you guys have like a population of 400 million people. We have a population of 25 million people. So the barriers to entry are a lot lower here in the United States compared to home because you have a larger population, there's more housing, um, and, and so it becomes a little cheaper. And to go out and buy my first duplex for 50000 bucks or whatever it was, uh, and it had a gross income of $1,200, it was just sort of, that blew my mind. Um, and I found the power of going into that duplex and doing it up a little bit, you know, replacing the floors, replacing some cabinets, and that in turn helped me increase the cash flow. And that was really powerful that I could control my investing um, by just changing, you know, rehabbing my units and, and increasing rent. Uh, and I thought to myself, well, if I can do it on two units, why can't I do it on 20 units or 50 units or 100 units? So my mind started to change to, to syndication and to commercial uh, multifamily real estate. Uh, for all those listeners out there, it's more, it just means more than five units. And it was really the power of controlling the asset and controlling the net operating income. If I can control that net operating income, I then control the value of the property and I can control how much cash flow I get in my pocket each and every month. So that's a little bit about why I love uh, commercial multifamily. <laughs> well, the the cash flow thing is something that uh, I think, you know, I couldn't agree more with you. It's the, um, I've, I've got a number of uh, single families and it's always been just kind of a wait and wait and wait for the equity to build. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it be the d decreasing balance on the mortgage or the uh, increase in values in the neighborhood, but that's all, you know, they, it, it, at that point you're you're waiting on the the market to increase. There's not really a lot you can do. You can you can spruce up some stuff, but you, you know you don't want to turn your properties too much because you don't make any money in single family turns. <laughs> but um, what in the the um, uh, I guess just thinking down the advantages of your your experience with multifamily, you mentioned uh, you know going from two and recognizing the, the power to increase that. Um, did you do any kind of uh, you know additional studying, or was this all just kind of like a self uh, reflection, self you know kind of taught from a standpoint of you, you did it yourself the first time and then recognize, hey, this adds up. I wonder if I can do more. Yeah, I, I definitely was self-taught. Um, I, I said I have an engineering background, so part of my professional job was I was involved with the ground-up construction of large um, apartment buildings in New York City. Um, plus, I'd been involved in uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars worth of infrastructure projects across the world. And when I started reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, and from from 2009 to when I pu purchased my first property in I think early 2012, that was all self-education. You know, getting to as many different um, real estate investing seminars as possible, really just learning as much as I could, consuming as much knowledge. Uh, and I got to a point where I had analysis paralysis and I just had to do my first deal. Uh, and I got, I got my first deal done and then six months later I did a second one and then after that I did a third one. And then, Darren, I got to the point where I was just like, 
I've ran out of my own money. <laughs> I want to keep. I want to keep growing my business, but how do I do that? And so I had to get smart. And some a, a buddy of mine had come down from Canada, and he talked to me about you know syndication or you know raising capital. And the penny just dropped because you know, take Facebook or Google or any of the big you know big businesses out there. They grew by using OPM or, or investors' money to help scale their business. So in my case, my business is real estate investing, uh, multifamily. So. Uh, it, I just thought that was just a natural progression for me if I want to continue down this path and, and make it a really, really, you know, full-time thing that I have to start raising capital from other people and, and, and doing syndication. So, it was just a natural progression to, 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 to help uh, a means to an end, so to speak. No, oh, absolutely. You know, you mentioned running out of your money and uh, uh, I think the whole thing that I found with syndication is the, the – um, the body of investors out there that are looking for a return but don't have a vehicle, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, uh, for an experienced uh, investor that that understands syndication and has a uh, plan, I, I've heard numerous success stories, and you know, you're you're another of uh, you know people that have been able to present uh, syndication ideas or opportunities to these investors seeking return and and be able to you know grow the assets and uh, continue. Uh, continue growing so it's it's a uh um i mean i love the story and i, I just think it the benefit is on all sides you know you've right. got the, the the investor with the capital that's not happy with the 0.01 in the bank uh maybe not as happy with what was going on in the stock market maybe likes real estate more than than uh, the hocus pocus of the stock market and uh you know so it, it's always a good fit um yep. So when when you're when you're doing this, are, are there any kind of uh, things that um, you know? I, I guess uh, confirm in the marketplace or any ideas that that uh, you know when you deduce the opportunities of where to invest. Is there anything that you know real estate um, jumps out? I mean, is it is there a a um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is there a, you're an engineer. That's where I guess I'm trying to come mm-hmm. from. You're an engineer. Right. Most engineers I know are very, very logical, thought process oriented. <laughs> I mean, and I, and I think if, if I had uh, to do it all over, I probably would have been, been, uh, you know, an engineer myself from a standpoint of just that's kind of way the path I go down. I think that's why it always makes sense for me. Right. But when, when you're, when you were thinking about investing, was there any, uh, anything in that, that, that thought process that, that helped you deduce as to why to do it? Or was it more mm-hmm. of a, a sense of, uh, you know, this makes sense that the, the passive, uh, investment kind of thing that, I mean, rich dad, poor dad talks about and stuff and having, you know, more income sources. Um, was there anything there that, 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 that encouraged you or led you down that path or, you know, solidified, yes, this is what I want to do besides kind of the, you know, you said you were getting all your education in that. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a good question because you always, <clears throat> when you, when you read that book, Richard Porter, um, he talks a lot about real estate in there, but in saying that there's still so many other vehicles out there that you can invest in. Obviously the stock market, um, is, is one of those investment, investment vehicles. Um, and it was just really about the fact that I was working in, in the structural engineering game for these large developers, and it just sort of opened my eyes into like, oh, hey, how come these guys are making so much money? Um, but also the fact is that uh, – and not not when I first started, Darren, but when as time has gone on, you know, the, the real estate is such a powerful investment vehicle. You know, you have your four, four forms of, of income from real estate. You have a, the tax benefits. You have cash flow. You have um, amortization where the, the tenants pay down your, your your loan and build up equity, and then you also have appreciation. So those those four different types of of ways to make money in real estate, and there's no other investment vehicle out there. Or you can you know maybe you can can uh, make make me sound like I'm wrong, but that have those four powerful benefits uh, that maximize everything. You know, a lot of investors just look at the return, but they don't actually understand that you got all the the mat the the, the depre- Appreciation aspect of, of owning real estate is huge. Um, the amortization, the build up of equity in, in any property because your tenants are paying down that mortgage. Again, another huge thing that investors just on the surface say, oh, I just want a cash on cash return or I want 10% or 8%. And that's why I'm happy with that. But they need to dive a little bit further into it and understand the true value of owning real estate. And again, no other investment vehicle out there matches how our real estate operates. Agreed. Hey, I want to talk to you uh, briefly just a little bit about financing. Mm-hmm. 
You know, you mentioned uh, when you bought a, a duplex, um, sounds like you're using more of your own funds. And, and did you get a, a note uh, for the balance? How did you? Yeah, that was a good question. So, um, for again, for all the listeners out there, when I first moved to the United States, I was pretty much non-existent in terms of the bank, uh, in, in the bank size, because I had no credit, right? I had to build up my credit uh, over a period of time. So, the first deal that I did was really that I had some cash, and I went out and bought it all cash. Um, and then after a period of, I think, four or five months or six months, I developed a, a relationship with a local bank. I'd be depositing my rental checks in there and they could see that the property was earning some income. Uh, And then I went to the bank after a period of seasoning and said to them, hey, do you reckon I could get um, you know, refinance some money out of this deal and buy a second one. And they said, sure thing. I got a, I got a $30,000 mortgage or a note on that. And I went and bought deal number two. Uh, And so, and then deal number three. So yes, I did, um, eventually get, get some financing for it. However, in the beginning, when I first, you know, ventured here because I was a quote unquote foreign national and no, 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 no credit score. It was a little bit tough. So I had to think a little bit outside the box. Um, and, and that's where it helped me develop my podcast investing in the U S uh, is because there's other investors out there who want to, you know, maximize on the, the cash flow and opportunities here in the United States. However, they're not educated on, you know, the financing side of it or how you get all the legal entity structuring set up. What about the taxes, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I went through those hoops um, when I first started here because that was part and parcel of what I had to do, right? I had to learn quickly as a, uh, um, you know, throw me in the deep end and make me swim, right? So, <laughs> right. Well, and, and I'm curious too on the financing, um, with your experience with the, the, the local or the bank that you were working with, uh, on and your first property was a, a duplex. What was your mm-hmm. second property? What was your another second? duplex? Uh, another duplex. duplex. Yeah. Okay. And at what point did you get into uh, north of uh, five units? Yeah, that was back in 2015, and I got to a point where, as in my my buddy from Canada came down. He was he just I went out. I can remember the, the conversation. We went out for for a drink around Christy time, Christmas time, and um, he said, you know, I said to him, oh, guess what? I'm buying. I've got three properties in upstate New York, six little units. Um, and I thought, you know, I was, thought I was I was killing it. And he he just he turned to me and said, that's awesome, Reed. And I actually just closed on 70 units in Canada. And I said, yeah, what? Like it just blew my mind. I was like, how? Well, well, well. Explain how you did that, and then he, he walked through the the explanation of getting a mentor and understanding um, syndication. And so, in two that was in two thousand and thirteen. In two thousand and fourteen, I um, I went and got uh, middle of two thousand and fourteen. I went and got a a, a mentor, and then from there, I uh, in two thousand and fifteen helped close on a two hundred and fifty unit property in uh, Houston, Texas. And then since then, we've done two other deals. Um, one's 296 units and the other is 320 units and, and looking to do more in 2017. Um, and, and for your listeners out there, you know, doing one or two deals a year is of these larger size deals is, is pretty good. Um, I'd love to do more, but you know, these, these deals do take a long time to close on and raise the capital and do all the due diligence. So, um, yeah, it's a little, it's a little, you don't do as many, the volume that is, isn't there, but you get the volume in terms of how many units you're buying at any one time. Well, and, and I guess, uh, I mean, first of all, that's that's huge. Uh, I mean, in since 2015 to now, to have uh, what is that uh, 296, 320. Uh, what do you get? Uh, almost 900 units. Is that? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a what's called a co GP. So I I don't obviously don't own all the 900 units, but I own a, a portion thereof because I raised a, a, a bunch of capital for those um, for those deals. Sure. Well, in any case, the the numbers are impressive. Uh, and uh, to be a part of that, that's uh, that's awesome. What what's your experience in in the uh, lending uh, aspects with you know the smaller, obviously with the smaller units for three three properties? I'm guessing the bank was pretty happy. They got to know you, and, and um, uh, you know they knew the assets and saw your your uh, deposits and all that. Make it sense, but from a standpoint of of a uh, single family or a you know anything under four units kind of um, uh, borrowing as opposed to going into the commercial. Uh, do you have any kind of uh, uh, sense of of the, the degree of difficulty? I mean... Yeah. Are you talking under four units or and, and versus over four units? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, under four units, as, as I'm sure a lot of your listeners are aware... Cast is quote unquote resi- resi- residential, um, and that's where the bank will obviously look at you, the borrower, and how you can fund the deal, how you can uh, uh, service the, the loan. So the bank obviously looks at you because when when it's under four units, 
the risk of someone leaving, say you've got a single family house, right? Uh, the bank will always look at you, uh, the borrower, uh, rather than the asset itself. Because if the, if the, t- if the property goes, becomes vacant, that means your, your single family property is a hundred percent vacant. And you know, they, who's going to service the debt then? And then that's why they underwrite you as the borrower in commercial, uh, when it's over five units, the, the, the banks tend to look at more the deal itself. So, and, and the risk of say you have a ten or twenty unit property that all the tenants just get up and leave, and the property is vacant, um, and who can service the debt? It's a lot. It's a lot lower risk than that. Twenty moves, twenty tenants will get up and move compared to a single family property where it's just one one tenant, right? So. The value of, of doing commercial is that it actually is a it's a little bit easier to obtain financing in the commercial sense because you, you they underwrite the deal rather than underwrite you as the borrower. Um, some of the the nuances of, of of large deals is that when you start getting into really really large deals, banks do want to see partners uh, involved in the deal who have a net worth of the the, the, the balance of the loan. And we can dive into a whole topic of, of how that works in financing. Um, but yeah, on all the deals that I've been involved in, we've had what's called a key principle. And, and that person has really been, you know, bring the, the bank balance to those big deals because everyone's saying, well, how do you go from, you know, six, six property or six units to, you know, 250? It's like, well, there's a process there and um, it's about educating yourself on that process. And one of those things is uh, with the financing aspect is that you need um, a, a KP involved in your deal so you can, you know, show that you've got experience, right? So, um, so yeah. Got it. Well, um, I'd love to get into that more, but right, I think what I want to uh, run with you on today was more of kind of uh, you were you were in New York, you were buying properties in New York. Uh, you're now down in Southern California, but you've got properties in Houston. Yep. And uh, help me help the listeners understand uh, why why you would invest out of the area as opposed to where you were or where you were, you know, up in New York. Yeah, that's um, – so I, I now live in Los Angeles, but um, uh, at the time, yeah, investing obviously in New York is very expensive um, and the cap, what's called the cap rate, the capitalization rate in, in sort of what I like to call tier one cities, which is your New York's, your Los Angeles, your um, Portland, Oregon's, I would, cl- I would class as a, as a tier one city, one where there's really desirable location to live. Um, and they have lower cap rates because the risk of um, – uh, it's, it's lower risk. So, so if someone says to you, or the cap rate in this market is four percent compared to another market, which might be eight uh, percent. It's lower. It's, it's a it's a measure of risk. So that that cap rate in that particular market of four percent is a lot lower. However, um, cap rate is the ratio of income to purchase price or value. So on, on, on markets where the cap rates are lower, it's very hard to make cash flow. Uh, and in my world, cash flow is king. So I definitely look for tier two markets like your Houston's, like your Dallas, Fort Worth, like your Kansas City, Missouri's, um, where I can go in and I and the, the cap rates in those markets are 200 basis points above uh, you know national interest rates. So what we're at four and a half percent now. So you're looking, I'm looking at markets around the Six and a half to seven percent cap rates, because that means I can make uh, solid cash flow, and I can, you know, I can, you know, make sure I can pay my investors, and, and we all get to benefit in the uh, in the cash flow and the in the appreciation of the property. So, when you your tier one market, you um, you mentioned, uh, do you typically find that's more of a one to one based on interest rates to um, cap rate? Yeah, yeah, I do. And again, it's a different a different strategy. Um, I don't do a lot of investing in tier one cities. So I, you know, I don't have a lot of experience in terms of what's like tier one cities in my in my mind. Um, we can get we can dive real granular <laughs> is that they have existing assets are, um, um, are trading above replacement costs. So, you know, right now in Los Angeles, there's a lot of cranes in the air because to to build new to build out new pro- uh, product because the demand is so there is still there. Um, you have to the existing assets. It's just cheaper to build than it is to go and buy an existing asset. However, in a place like Houston, Texas, or Dallas, Fort Worth, yes, there is still construction going on, but those existing multifamilies are actually trading less than in, in, in what, when I'm talking talking about existing multifamilies, I'm talking about like class C assets uh, built in the 1980s, they're trading less than the cost of replacement. So that because of that, you know, where we are in the market cycle right now, that is more attractive, attractive to me uh, and helps me produce uh, cash flow for, for all my investors. Got it. So is it, is it cash flow is pretty much the driver then that, that you're, uh, that drives you looking elsewhere? 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, cash flow is king in my world. Um, love, I love appreciation, and that's great. And I can force the appreciation through increasing NOI, net operating income. But first and foremost, I invest for cash flow, uh, and then secondly, I invest for appreciation. Gotcha. Um, when you're when you're looking in the uh, different markets, um, is there is there any kind of like cycles or any kind of uh, you know, thing that you see. I mean, obviously, when you're if you're taking a snapshot of the marketplace today, and you you pick all these different markets, you can uh, do a comparison as of a date. But is there? You know, you mentioned all the cranes in L.A. Uh, I know there's a lot of multi multifamily construction going up up here in Portland. Um, is there any kind of a cycle that you you tend to to recognize or anticipate? Yeah. I, yes, I, I not anticipate like no one's got a crystal ball, but um, you know, if you de- it depends on who you subscribe to. I subscribe to a different, a few different uh, publications, and I definitely keep my eye on where the where we are in the market cycle, given the asset of multifamily. Uh, it is pretty hot right now. You know, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Texas areas are really, really hot, and every every man and his dog are wanting to get involved in uh, in multifamily. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's still not deals out there you can go find. It just means it's harder to find those deals. Uh, my motto is that you always make money when you buy and not when you sell. Um, and given where we are in the marketplace right now, uh, interest rates are starting to, will, you know, they're expected to go up. But so that, that means when interest rates go up, so does so do cap rates. So cap rates will start trending upwards, which means that it will, will transition from, in, in the markets that I invest in, more of a seller's market into more of a buyer's market. And, and that's what I'm anticipating hopefully in 2017 and beyond. Um, that that will transition away from you know the last two or three years of really being a seller's market into a, as I said more of a buyer's market and um, and again there's always deals out there to be had regardless of where we are in the market cycle it's just about your ability to find those good deals or these oh I like to call them Kraken deals <laughs> so yeah oh, I remember that what you mentioned that uh, interest rates and cap rates track is that mm-hmm. um, uh, is that based on that spread. Kind of thing you were talking about. Uh, oh, just in general, it's ba- you know the, the the rule of thumb is that if int- you can't expect interest rates to go up without uh, some sort of um, effect on cap rates in that market, you couldn't you couldn't ex- imagine that if interest rates are going up and then cap rates remain the same, that doesn't really make sense <laughs> because sure. then you, you then you, then you're tra- transitioning into a tier one market. Not necessarily that, that doesn't happen. Of course it does. You know, Austin, Texas is a, is a prime example of you know 20 years ago it was a it was what's all I call a linear market where cap rates were you know there's a good difference between cap rates and, and interest rates. But now you know Austin, Texas is a really really hot market, and, and some would say nearly a tier one market. So um, again, it just it all they track one and one and um, one and each other. So if you know interest rates go up, so do cap rates. If interest rates go down, so do so do cap rates. So yeah, gotcha. And the the um, uh, Midwest in there, the Texas. I mean, Austin sounds like it's kind of an outlier. Um, or not, I don't say an outlier, but it's clearly a hot market that are right. Uh, I would say kind of more reflective of like some of the coastal markets. Um, do you find, uh, or, or have you looked in other, you mentioned Kansas City, Houston. Uh, do you find most of the, the Midwest uh, in a similar market yep. as far as the the uh, cap rates? Yes, I do. I do. And again, it goes from a macro point of view. You know, I'm sure if you jump on any Google <laughs> website and said, you know, uh, cap rates in the Midwest, I'm sure it's going to you're going to find uh, roughly in and around or for, for 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 Class C and Class B assets around the six to eight percent cap rates. So that's really where I look for. Again, it, it hits those from a macro point of view. It's 200 basis points, roughly above. Um, uh, while we are at interest rates, so that makes sense to me, and I'll, I'll move forward. There's, there's got to be other markets, uh, other factors in the market. Like obviously, there's got to be good GDP growth. Uh, I want to see a minimum of three major employers in any one market, um, and the po- I, I will not invest in a market less than 350,000 people. Uh, it just it's just too risky. Uh, a lot of people have invested in smaller markets, um, oil based markets, and uh, have have been burnt. So try to be. I want to try and be insular to to market fluctu- fluctuations um, in, in in commodity prices and stuff like that. So that's why I look for those three major employers. I want to drill down on this just a little bit because I think this is something that um, uh, I think anybody that's really looking outside of where they live, based on the affordability of uh, their opportunity to invest, if if they are living in a coastal town and 
and uh, you know it's out of reach for them there. They want to look elsewhere. So when you you mentioned a couple things, so three major employers is is uh, uh, when you say a major employer, how do you how do I how do I yeah, determine how do find, it's major? Yeah. 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 So like. <clears throat> For example, um, let's take I don't know Dallas Fort Worth, right? They've had. If you look at the major employers, their healthcare is a major employer. Financial financing sector is a major employer now. Uh, sorry, the bank. I should say the banking sector is a major employer. Um, Education is a major employer. You know, Dallas is is has got is really diversified um, compared to what historically it was being a, an oil town way back in in, in the, you know thirty four years ago. Um, Houston, however, ha- hasn't transitioned as much as what Dallas has. So, but I still want to see those major employers. So it's sort of just now how what's a major employer? Well, I don't know someone who owns uh, uh, employs over a thousand people. You could you could class as a major employer, or someone who uh, employs over two thousand people. Um, but you just really want to see that they've got longevity in their sectors. Uh, so education, medical is really good, and, and banking are the, are the big three that I look for. Um, military, not so much, and mining definitely. I don't want it to be a, a town that is reliant heavily upon mining or something like that. So you're not in uh, North Dakota, is that what you're saying? So, <laughs> yeah, right. Right. yeah, in the, yeah. The gas, the get the gas lands. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, you mentioned uh, 350,000 uh, people. Um, mm-hmm. That that's a uh, that's a pretty good bar for uh, entry because I'm thinking a lot of your college towns are yep. uh, out of that. Then you're, you're not you're not looking at any kind of college town, or it at least not unless they're a, more of a metro. Uh, right. Kind of a town, but I'm thinking of, you know, I went to Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas, and mm-hmm. uh, I don't think I, I think maybe a God, I, I'd be shocked if there's a hundred there. But yep. um, that's that's. Is there any kind of like a, an airport you associate with those kind of town? I mean, 350. I'm trying to think of. Uh, yeah, of some- like it's it, like 350 is a number. I, I will, I will. If it's a really, really hot deal, and in the town's only two hundred and fifty, like I'm not, I'm not splitting hairs here. It's just, it's just sort of a, 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 a oh no, a starting a, a, point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly, I, I, yeah, exactly. And I, but I'm just trying to think of, um, I'm just trying to think of a town that I'm, I'm uh, trying to think in my mind of one that uh, fits that with as far as uh, the numbers are because I, I think Portland's, I don't know, somewhere between a million and a million and a half as far as right. the, the metro when you take in all the surrounding areas. Um, I think is what is Boise? Is that? Yep, that could be another Boise, Boise Idaho. Yep, okay. that's, that's that's a good example. I don't know much about Boise, so, um, but it's it sounds like it would be. It's just these are all just litmus tests for your your listeners out there, just to keep that in mind. You, you do want a bit of a population base there. You want to see that population is growing. You don't want to see it that it's 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 declining because that's a that's a big red flag. Um, and and again, those three major employers. You want people, you want people who want to move there. So you want to just see a, a steady increase in population over a period of ten to twenty years. Um, that's a good sign that it's a it's a solid a solid market. And then you know you tr- you know um, have that go hand in hand with the population and the employers. And you know and it's got moderate cap rates and affordability is high. Um, then that's great. That's they're all they're all tick tick tick. Then then let's take the next step and start contacting some brokers. <laughs> uh, I like you just uh, spelling out some you know basic parameters because I mean I've I've uh, learned over time I whether it was a car or a boat or or you know even a rental property if. If you don't have the built-in demand, uh, you may be stuck, and, exactly. uh, or you exactly. may be selling at a discount uh, <laughs> uh, if there's nobody out there to buy your your uh, boat. I, I um, anyway, we can go on about that. But um, <laughs> the the um, in, in these markets, and do you? Uh, we've talked about the size of the population, the employment base. Um, the do you look at any kind of a uh i mean i don't know the cap rate obviously but what, what about like affordability how, how do you is there any kind of bar you draw to as far as um wages and mm-hmm. uh what the housing cost and that kind of yep. stuff and what's going yep. on yeah so um i know there's, there's so many different i know there's a lot of metrics out there that different people will talk about affordability indexes and stuff like that and i do look at the affordability index but um, my target market and demographic are, cl- are blue collar um, cops, teachers, um, people who uh, will, will probably won't own a house or have been burnt back in two thousand and eight and just won't ever own a house again. So they're, they're, the median household income for, for one of my units may be you know around the fifty thousand dollars or less um, a year. 
factory workers are a big one. And so when I look at that, I, I definitely want to keep in mind rents to household incomes or the average household incomes in, in those neighborhoods. Uh, another good thing or indication to track is you do really don't, and there's no rule of thumb, but you just want to be understanding what sort of percentage of, say, the household income is spent on rent uh, in, in that neighbourhood. Now, if it starts creeping above, you know, 45 to 50 percent, then um, maybe I, I believe that maybe uh, you know rents are too much in that in that market. So, typically in Class C neighbourhoods, uh, you're looking at about 25 to 30 percent of their income is spent on on a um, on, on, on rental uh, on, on rents, so you're looking at around the six hundred dollars a month to seven hundred dollars a month for someone who earns, you know, about fifty thousand bucks a year. So they're the sort of metrics that I I look at and I try and keep my my finger on the pulse as much as possible. But again, we are trending towards a more of a multifamily uh, state. A lot more millennials are are not settling down and buying houses, uh, which is causing a more pressure in the multifamily game. And why I like multifamily because there is always a demand for people to have a roof over their heads. Uh, and, and you know, historical data will show that house um, uh, house ownership is is declining uh, in in the the age gap between twenty five to thirty or twenty five to forty, I should say, uh, and that is a very very strong indication that multifamily is a, a, a solid a solid um, asset to be investing in compared to say you know office or compared to um, retail or compared to uh, commercial. So yeah, no, I like it. I uh, you know when you. Um uh, start looking outside, and you don't know all the streets, and you don't know all the uh, particulars of a certain area. You got to have some sort of a an idea, kind of a plan going in, and, and some sort of a basis for why you're doing what you're doing. If you want to be successful, otherwise, you're you're probably just looking to be the next sucker uh, <laughs> to to you know take take somebody else's troubles and and right. uh, you know good luck with that. So um, that's all all very good. Um, Reed, I'm, I'm I'm trying to think. Is there any more kind of a, a, a secret kind of a thought process that you uh, <laughs> look to, or that you'd share with the listeners when you're yeah. when you're out hunting for markets? The other the other big thing that I like people always ask when you're investing into state or you're doing what's called a desktop study of a, of a market. Um, the, it's not sexy, but what I always recommend um, I, uh, people that I talk to go out and analyze at least fifty deals in that market, and, and whether it's a deal or not, like just get on LoopNet, get on um, you know uh, Craigslist, get on some some brokers' websites. Anal- just it's about doing the analysis to understand. Okay, what is price per door? That's a very common. Um, metric people will use. So, understand what the price per door is. Understand what the average expense ratio is going to be. And and not, until you do, you know, 50 deals or more in a market, you won't be able to get a good sense as if you're paying too much or too little for a property. Um, so, as a, 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 a good saying my dad always used to say, was a fool in their money or easily parted. You can go and analyze it to the cows come home, and it doesn't cost you anything besides your time. And but what you're doing is through analyzing so many deals, you're becoming more educated on your market. You're going to understand where certain um, suburbs are better to invest in and where uh, are not. And that there would just you know you can do that all from your from your from your desk at uh, you know from from halfway across the uh, America. You don't need to be in that particular market uh, to go and you know walk the streets and understand that. Just through doing the metrics, you're going to be able to to establish a better idea of uh, where you're going to invest in that particular uh, chosen market once you have chosen it. No, that makes uh, complete sense. The uh, kind of doing your homework and, and really getting that kind of a, a base of understanding. And, and uh, you know, I think the the, um, the real treasure in that is that when you do come across a real deal after you've done all that homework, you're going to recognize it. It's going to exactly. jump off the page and like, exactly. oh, my God. Yeah, um, but again, you don't. People who just think they can get like, you've got to do those twenty-five deals. Otherwise, you just not. You don't know if you've been presenting a good deal, right? Like everyone's like, how do I know if I've been presenting a good deal? It's like, well, unfortunately, you've got to go through the analyze those twenty-five to fifty deals, and they're not going to be deals. But you'll understand why they're not deals because it's just it's too expensive, or the price per door is too expensive, or the the, the utilities. Um, sorry, the, the expense ratio is too high, and it doesn't make sense for for cash flow. So. You know, as I said, be educated. Uh, make sure you do your homework. If you can get a mentor or go to a local real estate investing club to learn more, 
I 100% recommend do that because that's where everyone should start. You should start with education first and don't rely on Uncle Bill told me one time about this <laughs> about this market. So go out there, be methodical, set up some systems, set up some criteria, um, and yeah, you're going to be you put yourself in, in, a, in a better place to be more successful. I like it. Reed, hey, I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to do this today. Before we uh, shut this down, uh, tell the listeners how to uh, best get in touch with you. Yeah, sure thing. You can head over to my website, which is rsnpropertygroup.com, uh, R for Roger, S for Sam, N for Nancy. Uh, you can click on my podcast tab, and I educate more of the international investors, but um, again, it's all education at the end of the day. It's for anyone who wants to tune in and, and, and learn about American real estate investing. Uh, if you are ever in the LA area and you want to you know, meet up and just have a yarn or have a coffee, then you can hit me up at uh, reed at rsnpropertygroup.com. And I do have a free ebook if anyone is interested in getting their hands on a free ebook, you can just email me and say free ebook at read at rsmpropertygroup.com and just put your name in the subject line, Darren, and um, yeah, I'll flick them on to all your listeners. That's great. And I'll be sure to put all those uh, links in the uh, show notes. So if you're driving or not able to uh, take that down right now, don't worry, it's there. <laughs> but uh, hey, Reed, I appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this and I uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Cheers, mate. Thanks so much. Well, Reed is one energetic guy. I uh, hope you appreciate his insight on how to recognize and select uh, different markets to invest in and uh, how to do the homework uh, that you must do to get educated, especially if you're investing in markets that are further away than the town you you live in. Uh, Be sure to check out Reed's website. That's www.rsnpropertygroup.com. Uh, He's also, be sure to check out his podcast, Investing in the U.S., an Aussie's Guide to Real Estate. And uh, also, he offered up his uh, free ebook. You can uh, send him an email at reed, R-E-E-D, at rsnpropertygroup.com. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. You're listening to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals. For more information on this or any of our guests, like us on Facebook, CREPN Radio.